next uh, chair has just appeared on the screen. Hi, Tomas. Uh, so without further ado, let me uh, let me just give the floor to you and please uh, gather your people. Um, ask them to show up uh, with their picture uh, throughout the panel. They should be muted except when speaking, but otherwise they should be uh, visible during the uh, panel. And then there is nothing else to say, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor, and thank you for having me today. It's my pleasure to, well, kind of moderate the next panel. And we have a great panel. Uh, the title is China and Southeast Asia in the Cold War. And uh, we have three excellent speakers today. Uh, in the order of the program, first of all, Holly McKenzie from London School of Economics and Beijing University, uh, Rian Tan from Columbia University and Sian Spo, and at last but absolutely not least, Yuvei Fu Corinne uh, from London School of Economics once again. So welcome to the panel. Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you. And I, uh, I, I presume based on the titles of your uh, presentations that we are uh, about to listen to three excellent uh, papers and excellent uh, topics. Since the whole program is running terribly be behind schedule, uh, and, and I think there is one more, at least, yeah, one more panel following our panel, I would like to ask you to be very precise when it comes to the timing of your presentation. If there is a chance to squeeze your presentation into 15 minutes, that would be even better. Uh, and then we could even have some time for, for a debate. So without, without further ado, let me invite Holly McKenzie uh, to start her presentation. And the title is The First American Women's Friendship Delegation to China, 1973. So Holly, if I may, the floor is yours. Hi, um, I'm just going to try and share my screen. Um, do you know where I where I should do that? Yes, on the top right corner, there is the leave button, a red one, and on the left side, there is share okay. content. Yeah, thank you. Don't push on the red one. Uh, right, I think I got it. Um, yeah, here we go. Okay. Let me just try and make it full screen. Can you guys see that okay? Perfectly. Okay, um, so thank you so much for inviting me to your conference. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. My name is Holly McKenzie. Um, I'm a master's student at the London School of Economics and Peking University in China. Um, and I'm studying international affairs. My presentation today is gonna be about my research into Sino-US Cold War cultural diplomacy. Um, the first American women's friendship delegation to China in 1973. So the first American women's friendship delegation to China involved 12 regular American women, including a four person film crew. Uh, you can see some of the delegates on the right hand side and regular meant that they weren't official representatives of the US government, they were private citizens. The delegation was led by the American actress and women's rights activist Shirley MacLaine, and the purpose of the delegation was to exchange experiences of women's liberation between the US and China. Between April and May 1973, the delegates visited six Chinese cities um, and a number of sites within those. Um, and afterwards, when the delegates returned to the US, Shirley MacLaine produced a documentary. She wrote a book about um, her time in China and she and the other delegates gave appearances to the United States and international media. So in terms of my presentation, um, first of all, I'm, I'm gonna give you my thesis for this presentation. I'm gonna describe cultural diplomacy in the Cold War and the differences between the US and China. Um, I'm going to talk about what I call the revolutionary context, which is the background to this delegation's visit, and the role of the US and the Chinese governments within the delegation. Um, you can see on the right-hand side is our friend, um, Mr. Henry Kissinger, talking to Shirley MacLaine, um, which I'll talk more about later. I'll also discuss the nature of the exchange that took part um, as part of the delegation, and the different ideas that the United States and the Chinese government uh, had about women's liberation. And finally, I'll conclude 
Um, I want to say that when I refer to China, that means the People's Republic of China rather than um, Taiwan or Hong Kong. So my thesis for the presentation is the first American women's friendship delegation was an example of cultural diplomacy because the US and the Chinese governments exchanged ideas about women's liberation through their citizens, which improved bilateral relations. However, differences in culture led to an asymmetrical exchange. Thinking about cultural diplomacy, so Milton Cummings said that cultural diplomacy was sharing culture between people in different countries to foster mutual understanding. According to Cummings, um, his idea of culture encompassed both information and ideas. So in our context, that means information and ideas about women's liberation. Cull added that cultural diplomacy is government facilitated exchanges between private citizens, so not um, officials, government officials. And there were also important uh, differences between how the US and the Chinese governments approached cultural diplomacy in the Cold War. So the US government placed a premium on authenticity and it used citizens, US citizens as carriers of its cultural diplomacy because it perceived, um, because it thought that um, people in other countries would trust the messages of ordinary citizens better. They would be perceived as more authentic. However, the Chinese government preferred interacting with foreign citizens in its cultural diplomacy because it thought they were more impressionable and easier to influence. They were also sufficiently distant um, from the state. Ooh. Um, so the video has gone off my screen. Can you still see my PowerPoint? Anybody? Yes, yes, perfect. Yeah, you can. OK, so um, I think the the background to this delegation was what I call a revolutionary context. So at the time of the first American women's friendship delegation to China, um, a number of domestic and international revolutions were taking place simultaneously and um, which I've tried to show through the pictures on the right hand side. So in America, they were experiencing the women's liberation movement. Um, the picture at the top on the right is um, a protest of women at Harvard University for International Women's Day 1970. Um, and the women are holding a banner that actually quotes Chairman Mao. Uh, so Chairman Mao said that women hold up half the sky, meaning that women are as important as men. China um, at the same time was going through another social revolution and um, between 1966 and 1976 it was experiencing the cultural revolution which was a movement to destroy political culture um, and complete the socialist revolution um, this is illustrated through the um, photo on the bottom right which is a 15 year old red guard and she's speaking to an audience of fellow Red Guards in Tiananmen Square in 1966. So this, these two domestic revolutions feed into an international revolution in Sino-US relations. Um, the final picture is US President Richard M. Nixon, who is standing on the tarmac um, at Beijing Capital Airport in February 1972, meeting Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai, um, and this is the first time that a sitting US president has ever visited um, the People's Republic of China, paving the way for Sino-US rapprochement and the eventual normalization of relations in 1979. So within this revo revolutionary context, um, the Chinese and the US governments supported the first American women's friendship delegation to China. And I think the main role that they played was one of gatekeepers. So on the Chinese side, the gatekeeper was a man named Chao Guanhua. Uh, he was the Chinese representative to the UN and he arrived in New York in 1971 to take up the Chinese seat at the UN, National, um, the UN Security Council, which had previously been reserved for Taiwan. Um, in October 1971, he had dinner with Shirley MacLaine and he invited her to China, um, which paved the way for this delegation to happen. 
On the US side, the gatekeeper um, was National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger, um, and he was the sort of self-styled architect of Sino-US rapprochement, and he also authorized this delegation. Um, I think that the US and the Chinese governments played sort of distinct roles that reflected their individual political cultures. So, for example, the Chinese government was a visible host um, and a propagandist. So the delegates, when they arrived in China, they were hosted by a state owned travel company called China Travel Service. And the employees of that travel company that um, showed the delegates around China were all Chinese government officials. The Chinese government was also a propagandist um, in that it allowed the delegates to film their experiences um, that they had in China and um, distribute the film that they made afterwards to promote the Chinese regime in the US. The US government role was one of an invisible funder, um, which reflected the US values of separating the state from society. And the funding for the delegation also came from the US side. So what was the nature of the exchange that took place? Um, so as I mentioned, the delegates followed a fixed itinerary that was designed for them by the China Travel Service. Um, they had very little freedom outside of this itinerary, but they visited many different places, such as workplaces, schools, communes, tourist attractions and a hospital. They had conversations about women's liberation with the Chinese people that they met. Um, these were both formal and informal meetings, so um, formal being prearranged by the China Travel Service and informal being spontaneous. Um, however, all conversations took place with the help of an interpreter um, who was a representative of the Chinese government and was able to sort of censor or change any messages um, for political sensitivity. You can see this picture on the right is probably the most important meeting that the delegates had when they were in China. This um, figure on the far left is Shirley MacLaine, and she's meeting the central Chinese figure who is Deng Yingchao, um, who's a member of the Chinese Politburo and the leader of the All China Women's Federation on May Day 1973. And this figure in black um, on the far right is the interpreter. So the exchange um, between the delegates and their Chinese host was asymmetrical, uh, in part because of the language barrier. So the, as I said, the conversations between delegates and, and their Chinese hosts needed interpretation. There was also an information asymmetry. So the American delegates um, very few of them had ever left the US and um, they were inexperienced about foreign travel and they knew very little about China, which meant that they found it difficult to interpret the things that happened to them uh, during their visit. Whereas the Chinese hosts knew a lot more about the Americans um, than vice versa. They had all interacted with foreigners before, they had met American people before and they also had sort of background dossiers um, on their individual backgrounds as well as the people that the delegates met in meetings had been prepared by government officials in what to say. There was also an asymmetry in the audiences. Um, although the American delegates were only 12 in number, they were able to reach a much wider audience um, in the US because they used their own initiative to produce um, books. Shirley MacLaine made a film and they also gave um, uh, they also spoke to the media afterwards. So how did um, the delegates and their Chinese hosts seek to portray um, each country's experience of women's liberation? So I think there were similarities and there were differences um, in their approaches to women's liberation. So first of all, um, both the Chinese and the American side try to portray the diversity of women's experiences. So you see this picture again is of the American delegates and you can see that they have different ethnicities, um, they're from different age ranges, they have different socioeconomic backgrounds and they do different jobs. So they're very diverse. Um, likewise, the Chinese people that they met were also diverse and um, they came from different parts of the country, they had different ethnicities and different professions. 
both the American and the Chinese side tried to show a break from traditional ideas of womanhood, especially women's role as wives and mothers. Um, and they tried to show how each society had expanded opportunities for women in both politics and the workplace. However, there were important differences in um, the US and the Chinese approaches to women's liberation that reflected individual political culture. So the US delegates, they stressed that um, women's liberation required individual freedom um, and a woman's right to choose how she lives her life, how she wants. Um, in China, they emphasize collective action. So women's liberation was a process of giving women equal rights with men um, en masse and access to all of the spaces and the roles that had previously been um, re reserved for men um, prior to revolution. So in conclusion, um, I think that the first American women's friendship delegation to China can be thought of as cultural diplomacy because it involved both the US and the Chinese governments and it relied on interaction between ordinary citizens. The delegates and their Chinese hosts um, portrayed similar and divergent experiences of women's liberation. Um, and there was also an asymmetrical exchange that took place owing to things like the language barrier and the information asymmetry. In terms of impact, I think the impact of the delegation was limited in China due to the much higher level of government control. Um, whereas in the US, the impact was much wider because delegates were able to use their own initiative um, to produce uh, a range of outputs, including um, Shirley MacLaine's film, her book, um, and the various media appearances that the delegates gave. Uh, ultimately, I think the biggest beneficiary of the trip was Shirley MacLaine herself, um, because she made money out of it, out of the book and the film. Um, she was able to sort of elevate her career. Um, two years before she traveled to China, she'd sort of made an unpopular TV show. So she was able to restore some of her stardom through this delegation. And she was also um, became a sort of friend to China. And she was invited to um, attend and perform at a White House state dinner for Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping when he visited China, uh, sorry, the US in 1979. And that's a picture um, illustrating that behind uh, where Deng Xiaoping is meeting with um, President Carter and former President Nixon. So I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Nice. much. It, I think it was a fascinating story about uh, uh, important and, and interesting detail of, uh, of the Cold War. And um, I presume now we should move on to the next presentation and then uh, have the Q&A at the very end of all uh, the presentations. So let me invite Ms. Tan uh, from Columbia University and Sciences Po. And the title of her presentation is Screening the Cold War in Southeast Asia, U.S. Culture, Diplomacy and Postcolonial Counter Narratives. So Ms. Tan, the floor is yours. Let me also just figure out how to share my screen. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, sure. So once again, on the top right corner, there is the leave button, the red button. And on the left side, there is an arrow pointing upwards, and that is the share content button. OK. Um, I've clicked it, but nothing really happens. Um, it should load a small kind of black screen uh, with with the screens you have open or the windows you have open. Could you please try to click on it again? Um, I have, but none of the screens appear. Um, strange. Yeah, I can't. Like there's a black rectangle, but there's no screens appearing within it, so. And is your presentation open in an, in another window? Yes, yes, it is. Okay, okay. Uh, that's, that's, wait, that's hang on. Let me try that again. Just kidding. I'm so sorry about it's this. It's okay. It's, you know, we we all have to face these technical <laughs> difficulties before. It's the beauty of pandemic. Um, I think it might be an issue with permissions, but I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> Just wondering. So if sorry I about this inconvenience. It's fine. It's Fine. I always have the same issue. It's my first time using Teams, so I'm not really like. 
set up for it, I think. Uh, yeah, and, and all of these applications are so different from each other, so. Perhaps it would make sense. I might try and reload it, and maybe it might make sense okay. for the next presenter to go ahead first, and then hopefully I'll figure it out. Yeah, that's a good idea. I was about to propose that. So if uh, it's not a problem to uh, Ms. Fu, I, I guess it's Ms. Fu, uh, shall we continue with your presentation? Yes, sure. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my can you see my slide? That's perfectly. Okay, can you, you can hear me right? Right. Okay, fantastic. Um, um yeah, okay. You can can you see my slides? Yes. Yeah, we do. Yeah, okay. So thank you so much for inviting me to present and um particularly thanks to Dr. Victoria Philip and my peers at LSE for supporting me to finish this project. So today, um, my presentation is about from Peking All Stars to Tuijian, US music diplomacy and rock music in China in the period of 1979 to 1988. So just based on my own Based on my findings, it seems that in the years before 1979, only Western classical music and Chinese folk music were regarded as the right types of music supporting and promoting by the official government. However, for the youth, other music types were more favored, such as jazz, pop, and mostly rock and roll. So I focus my research in rock music and specifically in the period of 1979 to 1988, from when the first rock band in China was founded to when the first influential Chinese rock singer came to the stage. So basically my thesis is about compared to the 1979 to 1984, Diplomatic and political concerns behind rock music in China had expanded in 1984 to 1988 due to the U.S. aim for assimilating China into the U.S. camp and China's aim for being an open country. So let's start from Peking All Stars. This was the first rock band founded in mainland China, and more specifically, its members were all international students in Beijing. According to one of the members, Graham Earnshaw's memoirs, he regarded Peking All Stars as the missionary linking the Western world and China. And also, the Baking All Stars' aim, aim was to spread the good word of rock and roll in China and also the power that lies behind it. However, Baking All Stars did not hold any large scale concerts as a period. They basically just performed at universities, foreign hotels, and also the embassies. And their main audience were foreign people living in Beijing and also university students, which also includes Chui Jian, who later became the godfather of Chinese rock and roll. And sadly, Peking All Stars were dissolved under the pressure of the anti spiritual pollution campaign in 1983. So, this was a um, political campaign leading by the left-wing conservatives of CCP from October to December 1983. And specifically, its target audience were artists, intellectuals, and urban youth. And its target music types were jazz, disco, and rock and roll. So if we look at the picture at the left side, this was uh, shows the cover of uh, an official document published from the propaganda department of the Chinese Communist Party. And from the power, it clearly states here, if you can look at this sentence, it means broadcast healthy songs and receive the unhealthy music. So unhealthy music in China of that period basically means all types of music except for the classical and the folk music. <laughs> 
and the photo at the left side, it shows a poster of the anti-separation pollution campaign. So if we look at here, there was a couple listening to the music, twisting and also dancing. And the men seemingly were smoking and the girl dressed in a very fashion style if we compare the lady sitting here. So basically, at that time, all of these couples doing were spiritual pollution, which needed to be prohibited by the Chinese society. And also we look at the picture at the right side and on the board behind, it clearly stated that prohibit play music and prohibit dance. So, but due to the resistance from the public, this campaign only lasts for two months. And in 1984, another rock band, Beijing Underground, was founded. And similar to Peking All Stars, this was founded by eight foreign students as well. And for this time, according to the interview with Paul, who's the member of Beijing Underground, Paul said that we wanted Chinese audience to realize that a policy of openness is better than isolation. If only from this statement, it seems that there was political drive behind the funding of Beijing Underground. But more likely, at this stage, these foreign students were more motivated by their own needs inside of the government requirements. And still, according to the Earnshaw, Memoirs. In the 70s and 80s China, in China, although China was following an open country policy, but in reality, for the foreign people, it was not permitted for them to have Chinese friends or really to talk to people at all. And if you did talk to an ordinary Chinese person, you were endangering their safety. And it was two sep very separate worlds, and the sense of isolation was very strong. So these foreign students had to make their own entertainment. So in this case, to find a rock band similar for them is the best way to entertain themselves and to more interact with Chinese people to get more opportunities to be involved in the Chinese society. But different from Peking All Stars, Beijing Underground did hold a tour in the cities of southern China during the period of 1984 to 1985. And specifically, this tour was funded by the Culture and Art Development Company, which was owned by the Central Philharmonic Orchestra of China. And this orchestra was under direct control of Communist China, Chinese Communist Party. So what is interesting here is that why did the CCP's attitude towards rock music and the Beijing underground in particular become more positive from 1984? So one interesting point here is regarding the timing. The tour of Beijing underground coincided with the foreign exchange crisis in mainland China. The volume of imports accelerated considerably, while the exports stagnated. And in 1984, the trade deficit reached uh, almost $1 billion, and the situation was even worsened in 1985. So in this case, Beijing was in strong need of foreign direct investment in order to finance its deficit to end the stabilize the scale economy. So for this reason, to support the, possibly to support the tour of Beijing Underground could show that China was more open to diverse culture and was more open to the Western world. And you can see that this is a um, photo record of Beijing Underground's performance. And here, you can see the concert hall is full of Chinese audience. So basically we can say that the influence of Beijing underground was very significant in the Chinese mass. So although the initial aim of Beijing underground was not to 
not not for certain political concerns, but their influence were noticed by the Chinese government, and then later on, it successfully hold a tour in southern cities of China. And in addition, except for the Beijing Underground, Wang also held a concert a concert in China as well in 1985, and specifically, the Wang. It's a British rock band. The whole concert was mainly funded by the CBS. And also CBS, CBS had one requirement for Wong, which was to film the show in order to sell the video in the United States. As stated in an article published on New York Times in 1977, CIA relied on its connections with the Time, Newsweek, and also CBS News. The president of CBS News, Sig, Sig Maxson, also recalled that he had been in a meeting with the chairman of CBS Incorporated and two CIA agents. It is difficult to conclude that the tour of war in China was supported by CIA, but in this case, as the only request from CBS was to film and sell the show, this show. So it is interesting to consider if there was any political force behind this tour. As we can notice from this picture above, the concert was full of passion, passionate Chinese audiences. So if selling this performance video in the United States, it could probably imply the idea that Chinese was passionate about Western rock music and more deeply, Chinese were happy with certain Western values, and China could also, as China also officially established a diplomatic relationship with the United States in 1979. So it seems that China was potentially assimilated in the U.S. camp during the Cold War as well. And except for the foreign influences, Chinese own rock music developed a lot as well. In 1968, Chinese rock singer Cui Jin came to the stage and brought his original rock songs to the public. Represented by Cui Jin, the young Chinese musicians pursued to express individuality and present personality through rock music. If we look at the picture at the left side was a photo of Cui Jin. He was performing at a concert. And the picture at the right side was shows the host of that concert. If you just look at the dressing codes of these two persons, we can hardly tell that they've come from the same concert. Like Cui Jin dressed in a very casual in a, in a very casual way, but the host was dressing in a very formal way. And actually, in reality, the dressing code of this lady was most, most performers will do of that period in China. So through the dressing, Cui Jin show sh potentially show that young Chinese young people, this Chinese young people have new desire for this society, and they want to express their own feelings. However, in order to published his songs. Cui Jian also combined social values into his music as well. As the name of his first album, Rock of New Long March, like the New Long March actually echo to the Long March, which is a significant event happened between Chinese Communist Party and um, Chinese Nationalist Party and uh, in which Chinese Communist Party uh, then a victory eventually. And uh, in addition, Cui Jin also added some traditional Chinese instruments into his composition, like bamboo flutes. And more crucially, Cui Jin's song, I Have Nothing, was acknowledged by the People's Daily. And People's Daily was the most official newspaper under the control of CCP. So in this article, it said that Cui Jin's song, I Have Nothing, had enlightened the Chinese masses in the period of transition from cultural revolution to reform and opening. And this was the first time that rock music was acknowledged 
by an official newspaper in China. So it seems that in 1988, the, Ch the Chinese art government's attitude towards rock music was more positive than that of before. So this is my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. I think that was another fascinating story about the cooperation, uh, or not the cooperation, but China's development and uh, cultural development during these times. And now let me turn to Miss Tan. Are you back? Yes, there you are. So let's try to check whether you can share your screen now or not. Yes, I think I figured it out. Um... Oh, yes, perfect. Great. Is it is it working? Absolutely. OK, uh, I'm going to close that then. So it's up. All right, perfect. OK, well, thank you so much for being patient with me and of course for allowing me to present at this conference. I'm so excited to share the work that I've done um, as part of the uh, Cold War Archival Research Fellowship Program under Professor um, Victoria Phillips. So my presentation today is going to explore how Southeast Asia, a key regional battleground in the Cold War, fits into the larger history of Cold War cultural diplomacy and examines how these initiatives interacted with growing nationalist consciousness and the emergence of Afro-Asian solidarity in the 50s and 60s. So by tracing the involvement of the United States Information Service, or USIS, in the Southeast Asian motion picture industry, paying particular attention to Singapore and Malaya during the period of the Malayan emergency and handover of power to the British by the British. Um, this paper attends to the formation of transnational film networks in the 50s and 60s and the attempts of Western powers to mold their, de their development in line with anti-communist strategy in Southeast Asia. So the complicated dynamics of Anglo-American cultural diplomacy are exemplified by the collaborations between the Malayan Film Unit and the USIS during this period, and given the post-colonial character and the uneven, uneven political orientation of different communities within these states, Western cultural diplomacy faced a distinct set of challenges in Southeast Asia and the Global South more broadly. Um, this research, my research has suggested and as seen in my thesis that American efforts to launch a coordinated information program um, countering communist subversion in Singapore and Malaya in the 1950s were complicated by the post-colonial character of the region, which exposed the fundamental dilemma of promoting free world rhetoric on the one hand, while maintaining the US need to coordinate with its British allies who remain seen as colonial powers in the region. Um, archival material suggests that an iterative process of fine tuning and calibration became necessary in order to address this local skepticism. And moreover, debates over program funding and expansion highlight the sometimes fraught nature of American collaboration with British authorities, reflecting their competing priorities in the region of the Cold War more broadly. So before I get into my presentation proper, I want to present a set of images. Here we see the head of the Malayan Film Unit, Tom Hodge, with awards won by the Malayan Film Unit at the third Southeast Asian Film Festival in 1956. Now, the MFU was um, a British, was associated with the British colonial regime, and its goal was to disseminate pictures that would um, ostensibly groom the population of Malaya to prepare them for independence, but often cohered more closely with the anti communist um, emergen emergency period propaganda of the British. Here, he's um, holding the the statuette for best film awarded at the Southeast Asian Film Festival. And this would suggest that Malayan film unit pictures were um, well received and well regarded within Southeast Asia, at least from a top down perspective. However, on the other hand, this separate set of images suggests that the MFU and the United States Information Service, who were closely associated with one another, had a less than positive reception amongst the local public. For instance, here we see um, demonstrators outside the USIS offices at Cecil Street in Singapore protesting the death of Patrice Lumumba in 1961, who was obviously a key figure in the global Afro-Asian movement. Um, the Belgian Chancellor's office was actually held within the same building and there was kind of a close identification of Western imperialist powers there. Likewise, um, even in 1965, post-independence, um, police reserve units continued to be stationed outside the USIS building to prevent May Day demonstrations by leftist or labor organizations. So clearly, not only was 
in, where US information services is not wholly capable of suppressing um, leftist identification in Singapore and Malaya, but they themselves became s symbols of imperialism or perhaps even um, the suppression of local nationalist consciousness. So how do we reconcile these two images? Firstly, I would like to provide some historical context on the Malayan emergency and how Southeast Asia emerged as a critical front line in the Cold War. While popular imagination tends to be dominated by the legacy of the Vietnam War in the US, um, the 1948 declaration of the Malayan emergency in fact marked the kind of first um, test of US anti-communist strategy in Southeast Asia in the post-World War II period. So, um, Concerned with the growing strength of the Malayan Communist Party, the British declared the Malayan emergency from 1948 to 1960. And this is somewhat ironic, as the Malayan Communist Party gained strength after the British had supported it and funded and armed it during World War II as the MPAJA, or Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army, and which had successfully driven the Japanese out of Southeast Asia. And as a result, the communists there, therefore accrued a great deal of prestige and credibility in the eyes of the local people, which presented obviously the Anglo-American alliance with a certain um, kind of propaganda issue in order to counter that prestige. Um, moreover, there was great concern over the Malayan Communist Party in light of the 1949 victory of the Communist Chinese Party in the Chinese Civil War and the formation of the People's Republic of China. In particular, overseas Chinese in Singapore and Malaya became perceived as a fifth column um, a pro-Beijing kind of constituency within Southeast Asian nations that would potentially destabilize and create problems um, within the transition to independence. There were great fears that should um, the British colonial powers retreat from Singapore and Malaya, um, communists or leftists would take power through electoral processes and hence necessitating this extended period of the Malayan emergency or a kind of protracted political handover of power in order to manage and like eliminate that threat. So in line with these goals, in 1942-52, Gerald Templer was appointed to become to the head of Malay and Singapore and launched a hearts and minds strategy that was aimed um, through various techniques at effectively decoupling the overseas Chinese population from any kind of affiliation with the MCP, while at the same time um, instilling a certain kind of Malayanization or indigenization of identity and to win over the local population to the anti-communist side without negating um, pro-nationalist uh, sentiments. However, these efforts were further complicated in 1955 with the Bandung Conference, which was led by um, regional neighbors, including um, India and Indonesia. So Nehru and Sukarno were obviously major figures in the convening of the Bandung Conference, or it's otherwise known as the Afro-Asian Conference and kind of so it was the formation of this third worldist movement that would eventually become the non-aligned movement. And it was precisely this kind of neutralism or like third way that um, the British and the Americans were so worried about in Malaya and Singapore, especially since these states had not yet gained independence at the time of the Bandung Conference. And they were very conscious of how these narratives would enter the kind of discursive sphere. So, um, these developments obviously threatened American strategic interests, but I also want to widen the dimension of what we're looking at. Recent trends in Cold War scholarship have definitely moved towards not only greater attention to cultural aspects, you know, the battle of words and images that plays out ideologically, but also a greater focus on cross-regional and transnational dimensions of the Cold War, thinking about you know, the circulation of these ideas and their mediation by both local processes and external actors. For example, Sang Jun Lee's work on the Asian Film Festival and the formation of the Southeast Asia um, Federation of Motion Picture Producers, the logo which we see here, um, which um, establishes the background of this transnational studio network that was forming in Southeast Asia at the time. In fact, um, the Asian Film Festival was supported by the Asia Foundation, which was itself an intermediary for US cultural diplomacy. Um, However, that's not the focus of the presentation today, but what I did want to highlight is the fact that Hong Kong and Taiwan, China, well, Hong Kong, Republic of China, Taiwan, all of these became part of a transnational network that allowed for um, films and uh, exchange of persons, exchange of technology to flow within the Southeast Asian region. So on the one hand, while 
um, Hong Kong served as China's window to the West. At the exact same time, it was also an American watchtower to counter the expansion of Chinese communism. And we kind of have a battleground where these two forces play out. And Hong Kong was also a gateway via film distribution organizations such as Shaw and Cathay into Southeast Asia, specifically Singapore and Malaya, because of the large overseas Chinese population there. In fact, it's exactly this that Theodore Schreiber, the US director of the United States Information Agency, um, took advantage of in 1956 at a budget hearing to say that, oh, there's a sharp increase in pro-communist motion pictures taking place in Southeast Asia. In Hong Kong alone, which is now the third largest film production center in the world, several hundred Chinese language films are being turned out each year by pro-communist producers. So what we're really seeing is this <clears throat> network or platform that was, and I want to analyze the ways in which um, the British, the Americans, but also locals were participating and moving through this space. So a little bit of context, the United States Information Agency and the Foreign Information Program was geared towards formulating a coordinated information strategy amid the rising threat perception of communist subversion in Southeast Asia. And some of their objectives included to multiply and intensify psychological deterrence to aggression um, by Soviet communism, to intensify and accelerate the growth of and confidence in um, people and governments of the free world, and particularly to combat extremist tendencies threatening the undermining of the cohesion and the stability of the free world and the withdrawal of governments and peoples into neutralism. So focusing on this last point, um, extremist tendencies have elsewhere been used to refer to um, labor organizing, anti-imperialist um, formations, and so on. So all of these um, groups that played a large role in the fight to remove the Japanese and to kind of overthrow um, colonization became framed in the American kind of Cold War imaginary as an extremist tendency, therefore, in a sense, eliminating the agency of local people. Um, in this context, I want to focus on the work of the USIS Motion Picture Service and the Malayan Film Unit. So in the CIA draft psychological strategy for Southeast Asia, what USIS was itself described as a propaganda agency seeking to conduct political warfare. In other words, even though it produced both documentary films and it ostensibly was an information service, the work that it put out was not neutral. It benefited from close connections with Hollywood elites and was part of a broader model of cultural diplomacy that included book programs, um, USIS libraries hosted in um, countries abroad, exchange of persons programs, and also obviously film shows. Um, one critical aspect was the use of mobile film units to penetrate rural areas with high levels of illiteracy. For instance, the Chinese new villages in Malaya, where um, Chinese have been resettled from like the jungles, where they were seen to have close relationships with the MCP, and into new villages or um, more modern villages where they were given uh, access to education and healthcare in exchange for cutting off their ties to the communists. Um, so similarly, the Malayan Film Unit was the kind of British iteration of this. It's a film organization affiliated with the post-war British colonial government that produced films in support of the British regime, as well as autonomous Malayan and Singaporean governments. So the key goal was to interpolate a Malayan identity in order to eradicate the threat posed by communist ideology, particularly via the overseas Chinese and their close involvement with the labor movements. So YCMP has a lot of work on how the conventional mainstream narrative of the Malayan Film Unit as a positive organization that quote unquote prepared the um, population for, for independence and self-governance by fostering national identity was in fact very much geared towards and targeting the overseas Chinese in that sense could be seen as extending the divide and rule nature of British colonial governance. So one film that the USIS worked particularly hard to produce in Singapore was Kampong Sentosa from 1953. So here in Business Screen magazine, we see that um, they didn't do such a fantastic job of hiding how the film was funded. So under New York City recent productions and sponsors, we see Kampong Sentosa funded by the State Department. What it, the USIS effectively did was it commissioned New York Sound Masters, which was a New York based production film to production um, studio to film on location in Malaya and Singapore. So to summarize the film, it's basically dealing with the um, emergence of the MCP terrorist threat and the need for these two villages to develop um, 
the village protection groups, and it talk, and it has a very binary opposition between good and evil, where the terrorists kind of harass the villagers, take their food, and the villagers must unite to defend against them. Um, what is notable, though, is that in this film still, we can see that the um, communist guerrilla is Chinese, and you know bears a kind of very aggressive expression with the star logo, whereas um, uh, the innocent Malay man wearing the songko, which is like a clear like um, sign of his, of his ethnicity, is in a kind of compromised and vulnerable position. So again, very clear kind of black and white staging of the roles imagined, but that also kind of overlaps with um, racial and communal dynamics within these countries and it replicates the British divide and rule that pitted these ethnicities against each other. So for Chinese, what the Chinese people in Southeast Asia were effectively presented with a binary choice. They had were either anti-communist or they were anti-Malayan. And this obviously um, was designed to eliminate or decouple their attachments and the risk of um, communist subversion in Southeast Asia. However, this kind of narrative was not uncritically accepted by the population. So we see here a article taken from the Straits Times in the same year that asks, what lies behind the mystery of Kampong Sentosa, an anti-red film in Malay that no one can explain? Um, the fact that this film was screened in Malay kind of signals that the target audience was um, not, necessarily, not necessarily the Chinese, but the Malays or the Malayan population, a clear attempt to target the locals and to reimagine a kind of new communal fabric in the country. Um, however, this article was incredibly critical, saying it's frankly anti-communist propaganda woven into the homely life and love of a particular group of Kampong villagers. Moreover, it is deeply suspicious of the origins of the film. When the makers, Sound Masters Incorporated of New York, sent a camera team here over a year ago, they could hardly have expected to see the color of their money again. Why then did they make it? Was it Soundmaster's altruistic gift to the world? So behind this kind of like clearly sarcastic questioning lies a kind of suspicion or an, even more than that, an awareness of the fact that there is foreign intervention and a kind of foreign hand in a lot of the activities that were going on at the point in time. Um, while elsewhere in the uh, article, it was actually um, reported, they, they had some comments from a viewer of the film saying, well, actually, it was slow paced, but still entertaining, somewhat dull, but I did not find that it exaggerated the facts. However, the person providing this statement was Miss Eileen Chuk, who was employed as the assistant film censor in Singapore at the time. So again, all of these statements suggest a kind of, or brings up questions of bias in association and what um, other forces might be at work in the screening of this film. Now we move on to the Malayan film unit, and two prominent films that they produced in around the same period would be A New Life, Squad of Resettlement, and The Knife. Um, the New Life film is particularly relevant because it was kind, kind of exists to dramatize and support that process of the resettlement of Chinese squatters into the new village away from the Malay, edge of the Malayan jungle. Um, at the time, obviously, this was part of a stepped up information program directed by William R. Langdon, and he observes that because the overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia are a potential fifth column, special attention must be devoted to managing them. Um, likewise, the knife is very similar to Kampong Sentosa in its um, staging of a binary black and white opposition between um, good Malayan, Malay citizens and Chinese communist terrorists. It opens with a Malayan home guard parade, which we see here, honoring two guard members responsible for killing MCP terrorists. And the reason why I want to highlight this film again is the title says the knife, but the knife in question used is a Malay keris, which is again a very symbolic dagger uh, that was um, indigenous to and part of the culture of Malay tribes people in Malaya. So again, we see this playing heavily on existing communal anxieties by carefully tailoring its materials to local interests and conditions. That was part of the overall strategy intended for these films. However, the racialized characterization of the communists does not reflect reality. For instance, when it was the MPAJA, um, Malayans and Singaporeans of all ethnicities volunteered to sign up to fight the Japanese. And later on, the 10th Regiment, um, led by Abdullah Sidi, um, 
was an explicitly multi-ethnic regiment, and in fact, Abdullah Sidi would become the leader of the MCP later on, so directly contributing this pro-Chinese narrative. So what do these things tell us? It suggests that for um, USIS and MFU um, cultural diplomacy through motion picture films more broadly, there were certain complications. The first is the post-colonial problem. Although American officials acknowledged the problem of imperialism in many of their archival documents, emphasizing the need to um, distance themselves from colonialism or not appear as if supporting colonialism, they continually framed this as a problem of optics, rather than recognizing the real reasons why um, the local populations would have grievances or be opposed to the um, intervention of um, foreign powers in their own domestic self-determination struggles. So obviously, their, their responses to this involved trying to discredit communist appeals by arguing that um, communism was merely like a new form of colonialism or a new form of imperialism, as well as to co-opt locals, to bring them into the fold, especially to hire local directors for the Malayan film unit. Um, that was one of another key point in archival documents, saying that emphasis should be placed on developing programs which utilize indigenous personnel. But none of these really target the root issue, which has to do with preserving the agency and autonomy of local peoples rather than merely papering over um, the most obvious examples of American involvement. Um, likewise, local resistance was again described purely as being extreme nationalist, neutralist, and anti-colonialist sentiments produced by or strengthened by communist lines, again providing little attention to the reasons why um, leftist organizations with the MCP managed to take such a strong inroad in schools and trade unions at the time. As a result, in a 1962 survey of reactions of motion pictures, so two years after the end of the emergency and more than 10 years after the first screenings of Kampong Satosa or um, A New Light, so on, USIS films were still seen as lower in impartiality than the Malayan film unit films, and with 15% describing them as propaganda. Why were the American films viewed with partic in a particularly negative light? Perhaps we could see this as because um, they were more distinctly and more clearly an external source, whereas the Malayan film unit films um, at least took some care to appear as being supported by the local population. Um, however, there are limitations to simply bringing on locals to projects in order to deflect accusations of imperialism. Here we see some uh, an article written by Tom Hodge, the director of the Malayan Film Unit, kind of like self-gloriously titled 11 years of the Malayan Film Unit, a record of solid achievement. A huge amount of emphasis is placed into this report on highlighting the role of locals, such as Peter Amavasi, a Malayan Film Unit camera director, and um, this paragraph stating that his success was bringing locals into the fold. However, I think it's worth asking that if these productions continue to replicate um, simple binary narratives or colonial policies of racialized divide and rule, to what extent can we really say that they have kind of transcended or become truly Malayan? Likewise, in the um, Federation of Motion Picture Producers in Southeast Asia, while these are all um, local individuals indigenous to the countries of Southeast Asia, um, the festival itself remained funded by the Asia Foundation and um, was very clearly geared towards kind of anti-communist narratives. And this was obvious in the films that they promoted and awarded awards to, like we saw with Tom Hodge and his statuettes. So this leads to a second complication, however, which involves the dynamics of Anglo-American collaboration. Uh, I'm so sorry, Ms. Tan, I'm sorry. Could you please wrap it up soon? Because this yes. is getting very long now. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. I will wrap it up. I can summarize the final end, the final points, which is that um, because of this post-colonial problem, the U.S. needed to both strengthen anti-communist narratives, but also they couldn't be seen as being too closely associated with the British, and this created a lot of tensions within their relationship. So key findings are simply that there was a strong history of labor organizing and resistance, and it's wrong to kind of paper that over, and that anti-communist and pro-Western narratives were not uncritically internalized, and Obviously, this post-colonial problem actually created some uh, tensions within the Anglo-American alliance because the Americans wanted the British to do more, but could not directly step in because then they would become assuming that vacuum of imperialism in Southeast Asia. So, sorry about that.
<laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I am sorry, sorry for, for interrupting you. You're seemingly very enthusiastic about the topic, what is great, but uh, since there is one more panel to go, I didn't want to push them into the late evening. So. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for all three of you to uh, for these fascinating and, and quite interesting topics. Uh, I learned a lot, to be frank, even though myself, I, I, I'm dealing with Asia, but of course I focus on more than Asia and, and the Chinese foreign policy. And uh, I think what you just tapped into is kind of a niche market because at least myself, I've never, never listened to any presentation about these topics before. So I am very grateful to you and thank you so much for shedding light on all of these three uh, topics. So let me open the floor to, uh, to questions. So let me invite uh, anyone in the group or in this meeting to raise some questions to any of these um, excellent scholars today. I guess anyone, everyone is getting tired a little bit. So let me raise a question to, to Ms. McKenzie. Um, um, are you aware of any subsequent uh, visit of, um, oh, sorry, well, what was the name of, of Shirley MacLean to China later on? So did she keep contact with the Chinese or was it a one-off event? Um. So as far as I'm aware, she didn't return um, to China and the event was a one off. I haven't seen any subsequent um, women's friendship delegations or American women's friendship delegations that went to China um, afterwards. However, I've looked at other archives and I know that women's delegations were something that the Chinese discussed often. So they discussed them as well with the British. Um, and also um, women's delegations were organized through a number of different um, friendship societies or Chinese friendship organizations that were outside China in the 70s. Okay, thank you. That's a quite interesting detail how, you know, American emancipation of women and one of the very few benefits of communism, and that is also uh, women's rights, uh, found each other and then were able to work together in, in a very special way. Okay, we have a question. Han uh, raised his hand. Yes, hi. Hi, um, I also have a question for Ms. Uh, Ms. McKenzie. Uh, you addressed this somewhat in your um, presentation about how the American delegation profited from it. And I wondered if the motivations of the delegation were somewhat corrupted by the desire to profit off of it, or is it was seen as a genuine opportunity for cultural exchange? I know that in American culture, uh, there's a long running trend of a certain degree of alienation from China, a, a view of it as an exotic other that can be commoditized or uh, needs to be regulated. I mean, going all the way back to the Asian Exclusion Acts, uh, John Pomfort in his beautiful uh, country in Middle Kingdom talks uh, at length about the desire to display not just Chinese products like porcelain throughout uh, the 19th and 20th centuries in the United States, but also the desire to import uh, Chinese people al almost as an exotic curiosity. Harvard uh, made a, a substantial amount of money uh, charging um, admission to uh, presentations given by uh, Chinese exchange students in the 19th century. So I was wondering if if there's if there's a common theme here we're continuing to see with this delegation because China was such a far off and, and you know in the American mind a far off exotic and alien place. Um, sure. Yeah. Thank you. That's that's an interesting question. Um, I would say in terms of the American delegates willingness to profit off of their experiences in China, I would say this was solely limited to Shirley MacLaine and I think actually Shirley MacLaine's chief um, motivation was more her activism than um, any material gain. Um, from what I can tell, the delegation was assembled extremely quickly. Um, it was organized, sort of the delegates were invited something like two week, two months prior to departure. So they probably really didn't have much time to think about how they could leverage this. Um, their motivation seemed to be one of adventure um, and personal fulfillment. They were keen to see what 
um, life was like for women in China. Also, it was fully funded, so they really didn't have that much to lose. Um, however, so when they returned to the US, um, they did help um US China relations in various ways although I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say it was motivated by any personal gain either um for example one of the delegates is the mother of the former CEO of eBay Meg Whitman um and some news reports say that um Meg Whitman's mother her experience in this um Chinese delegation prompted her to um encourage Meg Whitman to expand eBay into China in the 2000s. So there is a commercial aspect, but I would say it's not um, particularly, it's not at the forefront of the delegation. Thank you. OK, are there any other questions? Uh, meanwhile, I have a comment to, to Ms. Fu Yuwei. Uh, maybe you heard about it, that Hungary has its own music diplomacy in China. Uh, are you from Beijing? Well, what? No? Because if you, if, if you ever visit Beijing, please do visit the Hungarian Cultural Center. It's in the Soho building. And over there, they offer uh, music, kind of music trainings to small kids. Uh, called the Kodai Method. Kodai was a very famous Hungarian uh, musician and comp composer, and uh, Hungary tries to utilize his heritage as kind of a music diplomacy or source of music diplomacy uh, in China. It's quite fascinating because maybe you heard about it, but the Hungarian and um, East Asian and Chinese folk music is very similar. Both of those are based on the so-called pentatonal or pentatonic system. So if you listen to Hungarian folk music, it, it is pretty similar to Chinese folk music. It's, it's quite surprising because, we, you know, we Hungarian we are coming from Asia. Well, wow. yeah. yeah, it's really interesting to know that. Yeah, I'll definitely visit it later. Yeah, yes, do. It's, it's a lovely place. Yes. Okay, any more questions? Okay, in case there are no more questions, I would like to say a big thank you to all of our three speakers today. I think uh, all three presentations were great, uh, very detailed. Uh, so I would be happy to read uh, the final product if, if it will be published in one form or another. And uh, let me give the floor back to Professor Chaba Bekesh and thank you for your attention today. And uh, please stay with us for the fourth uh, panel today. Okay, bye-bye.